Good evening. Thank you for tuning in to Let's Live with Thurman Greco, coming to you from scenic downtown Woodstock on Channel 23 Educational TV, and also coming to you from Let's Live with Thurman Greco on YouTube. And we've got us a really neat guest coming back. You've had a lot of uh, reviews, a lot of people like your show, they liked the first time you came mm -hmm. on, and so you're, you're coming back. Can you tell us your name and how they can reach you and a little bit about the market? I think, I think the flea market has some real interest. Uh, yeah, I'm Gary Beagle, and uh, thanks for having me back on Thurman. And uh, I'm out to Mowers Market every Saturday and Sunday in the summertime, and I also have an eBay store. It's uh, GB58. If you do a seller search, you can find me there. And uh, other than that, I'll also have some stuff in the Historical Society here in Woodstock, and uh, so those three venues, you can find my stuff. Gary, the, the, the Historical Society, how does, how does one find you in the Historical Society? You go up on, is it Kamu? I don't even know the correct pronunciation. Oh, you go up the Como. Como Drive, and that's where the Historical Society is. And I think they're open from April or May into the early fall, fall like September. I don't know the exact days they're open. I think they're open on the weekends and walk through the door and the gift shop's right there. And I mean, my stuff's in there, mainly just the ornaments and uh, Suzanne Nelson has some of her stuff in there and uh, Sue Hoffman has her jelly. There's about four of us, four or five different vendors that they asked to be part of the uh, historical society. So, And the ornaments that I have in the historical society they're exclu I make them exclusive to the Historical Society, those particular ornaments. So you can't get them at the market. I, I don't want to compete with myself. Right. Because part of the money goes to the Historical Society. So those particular ornaments, which are larger glass balls with different peace signs and different images on the interiors. So if you want any of them, visit the Historical Society on the days they're open. I think the Historical Society has a Facebook page. So if you just type in Woodstock Historical Society, I'm sure you can find it yeah. on uh, the internet. I think the Historical Society is open on Saturdays. Oh, yeah. I, I'm, it might be open on Sundays as well, but I think it, it is open on yeah. Saturdays because that's when the most people are wandering up Como. But you know, a lot of people are watching this show. They come to visit Woodstock and they don't know about the Historical yeah. Society. Because it's kind of stuck off, you know, off of the one side street, but uh, I, I I think they're trying to get more notoriety out there about about the Historical Society because they do offer a lot if you want to learn the history of the whole Woodstock area, that's the place to go. Yeah. Well, and we have so many new people in our community and if they want to find out about Woodstock, that's a good way to do it. Yeah. That really is. Well, so what you're saying then is these things will not be there. No, but these the, things are at the flea market. At the flea market, and also on my eBay store site, I have some peace signs, I have some paintings, uh, some of my little nutcrackers that I do. <clears throat> They're more for the fall of the year, but I do keep them up on eBay all season long. But uh, the historical society is exclusively just the ornaments, mainly just because that's all the room that they have for them right now because of the space limitations that they have. And, and the flea market opens on the 22nd of May. Uh, 20th, isn't it? I 20th, think, yeah. something like that. Yeah. The May. last half of May, and it goes through... October. Um, October. Yeah. And, and uh, we used to... It's like we when I first started coming to the flea market, we would go into November maybe, yeah. depending upon the weather, but yeah. I'm getting the feeling now that we really are cutting it off at the end of October. I think John's getting tired. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know he's been doing that flea market yeah. for 50 years, I think. Well, what are we in, 46th, 46th, 47th, whatever it is, yeah. I mean, that's a lot of years. Yeah. That's a long time to have a job, you know. And I, and I can remember several years ago, he was trying to get uh, some relative, a son or a nephew or something, yeah. to help him, and it didn't work out. And, and I, listen, I know that experience, I, you know, because... I, I'm always asking my daughters to help me, and they're always saying, oh, no, mother, please. <laughs> please, no, no. So you are coming back the second time, 
And, and one of the reasons you're coming back, and I feel like there will be some future visits, is because people love to go to your, to your uh, YouTube page because you have, you have a wonderful show, a wonderful presence in here. So what goodies have you brought us today? Okay, and we'll talk about a few of these things real quick, and then I guess we'll get into the topic of what we were going to talk about is uh, different signs after loved ones pass, but we can kind of transition into that, I guess, after we... Okay. So the peace signs, which, uh, you know, everybody knows I do the peace signs, so we'll hold those up, and they're available at the flea market. I do different size ones and variations on all the different ones. Now, is this the smallest peace sign you do? Uh, pretty much. Um, I've done other ones, maybe do like a peace sign on this type of thing. I'll stick a peace sign on. But as far as the traditional cutout, wood cutout peace signs, that's about the smallest ones. And But these are not the largest ones you do. No, I do uh, quite large, which I had a couple of them last time I was on the show. And just wherever my mind takes me as far as doing those, from chess boards to more traditional to abstract, to, you know, I... When oh, I start you've doing done them, some really know. lovely ones. Yeah, I'm working on an abstract one right now, a big abstract one. It's not quite done yet, but probably by May it'll be done, so that'll be ready for the show then. So, but, uh, and of course, this is very woodstocky, and and these look like uh, little Valentine ones. Yeah, and those you can either use in your car, off your windshield, like windshield, those things they hang off the windshield, or you can use it as an ornament or just to give to somebody and. I started doing with the uh, the gears because of the steampunk thing. All the young kids are into the steampunk thing, but I didn't want to just go straight to steampunk. And since I'm in Woodstock, I combine the psychedelic colors and the tie-dye colors with the steampunk gear image, so it's kind of psychedelic. Steampunk is the best way I could describe it, which i never seen anybody. Usually steampunk, it's more blacks and grays and those colors. Now let me ask you something. Don't you think that you could put some essential oils on this, especially if you put it in your car? Yeah, you probably could. You know, yeah. on you have this this kind of strain would do really well. Yeah. Oh, I think that would be lovely. That would really be lovely. Well, I can send them over to Sue because that's what she sells right next to me at the <laughs> market. They right. Buy that and send them over to Sue. Right. They can go to <laughs> Sue and get some essential oils. And, and now, these, these are just precious. Yeah, all of a sudden I was doing waterfalls, and it seems like people like waterfalls, and they like the purple colors, and the purples and blues seem to be a popular color, so I've been doing those, but I do other little mini ones, and they seem to be liking those. They buy those, they get the easel with it, so they're all set when they get home to put it on a shelf. Or well, and this is something that you can t tuck in your suitcase or whatever, yeah. take with you when yeah. you go back home. Stick it in your pocketbook or whatever. Yeah, it's so that's really easy to do. And then I'm doing these little mushrooms, and I'm going to hold a couple of those you know, up. I, you know who else has picked up on the mushroom theme? I think this is something that's growing in popularity. Candlestock. Oh, yeah? Candlestock has yeah. now got mushrooms outside their door. Oh, I've seen those. Yeah, right as you go in. Yeah. Like in their little garden areas. They have to, I yeah. actually was in there uh, I don't know, a couple months ago because I don't get to walk around town sitting at the flea market. So I came up one day and was just walking around. And I noticed those as you go into Candlestock. And if you go out 212 towards Saugerties, they've, they've got a building out there. And I don't know what, I don't know what the building is. I just, and I recognized it because of the mushrooms. Mm -hmm. So, and the mushrooms are this kind. They have the tall, the stems, the uh -huh. tall stems. They're not little squatty yeah. mushrooms. But these are darling. Yeah, I'm painting them up, doing little flowers on them or whatever. And, and, yeah. and you and make I order, these uh, and, yep. then, and then paint them. Paint, uh, and paint them, and I artist sign each one on the underside of the cap. So they're all artist signed, each one individually artist signed. And it says Woodstock. Yep. So this is great. This is a good little thing to take, Oops. to take back home. As I knock everything over, it's... these are the first collages I've ever done. I never did collages before, but Sarah Pearson, who's the executive director down to Walker River School in Montgomery, uh, they're having their member show May 20th. Actually, it falls on the same weekend as we open the market. And for $75 admission, you get 
uh, a dinner. You get music. They're going to have poetry readings. And you also, for that admission fee, you get an original 5 by 7 piece of art by one of the Walk Hill River School artists. So these are going to be donated to the Walk Hill River School to raise money. And the money, a lot of the money goes to their youth programs for their summer kids programs to teach them about art and teach them different things that they have geared towards kids. It also goes towards their senior art classes, their veterans, they have different classes for and different group things, support for veterans that they do there. So all the money generated from this uh, members party will go to support that. And they're also trying to raise money to buy their own kiln so they can do more sculpture and pottery and that type of thing there also. So how, long have you, how long have you been involved with the, with the Wall well, Skill School? Walk Hill River School. Uh, around the time that my dad passed away, I ran around 2011. That was my friend Joan, who I mentioned last time. She's the one who got me going there, introduced me to a lot of the artists. And so, yeah, 10 years or so. It's more yeah. than that. I think it's closer to 12 years. Yeah, well, we're, you know, it'll be 12 <clears throat> years this year. But. Yeah, so you've re you really... You have you have a place there. Yeah, it's a good it's a good venue for uh, like I say, children, people, children that want to learn art, older people that want to learn art. Uh, they do classes. They have different days of the week. Different people can come in. The senior the senior class they don't charge any fee for the seniors to come in and paint one day a week. Really? And, uh, Which day is that? That's Tuesdays. Yeah, it's for like about three or four hours in the morning. And they have a teacher there, Vicky. She's the teacher, and uh, and they, it's not formal classes. So she'll come around. You can paint whatever you want. She'll come around, give you guidance or help if you're stuck on some thing. Oh, this sky doesn't look right, or this building doesn't look right, and just give you little pointers on, uh, you know, wow. how to improve your art. And so it's it's a good place, and uh, the members party is one of their larger fundraisers that they do each year, and uh, so that's May twentieth. And it's from five to eight, and with every mission, you'll get a piece of art, five by seven piece of art. You know, that's very, that. in, that's very interesting because I'm art challenged. I literally, I just, I never have. I, I write, and both of my daughter, daughters are artists, mm -hmm. and one of them teaches art and uh, has regular shows in galleries, and the other one uh, just has not. She could, but has not. I, I, by the time I was five years old, I just realized the worst thing in the world was the art class. You know, I couldn't use the scissors, I couldn't use the pencil, I couldn't use anything. It was in the middle of World War II, and there was nothing. And I, my grandmother took me to, to the kindergarten and I saw a pair of scissors for the first time in my life, and I had no idea what to do with them. So, I when you, when you talk about a senior, oh my God, that poor teacher would probably run off down the road screaming if. She, but you're left-handed, right? I heard on one show say you're left-handed. Well, but I, I you finally learned to use the scissors with my right hand. I'm left-handed too, but it's left hand, right side of the brain. Uh huh. Your, your right side's the more intuitive side, so. You're artistic. You just don't realize you're artistic. I just don't. Have, <laughs> I just don't have the confidence. That's all. That's all. They actually had a class down there at Walk Hill River School. I think it was called painting with the right side of your brain, and I didn't take the class, but I guess it was to get you to focus more on your more intuitive artistic side. But yeah, they say you know. The, well, I learned that with my dad having the stroke too. That this side of your body is controlled by this side of your brain, this side is controlled by... The left side is controlled by the right side of your brain? Yeah. Or the right and side. vice versa. Yeah. Wow. Well, you know, I just, and I know that uh, as a writer, I've been taking writing classes for since forever, and they'll always tell you, or my teachers, the different teachers that I've had, have always said in the spring, listen, uh, go take go take a drawing class. Go get in a go get in a painting class. Your writing will improve. They did not necessarily say this to me personally, but to the whole mm -hmm. class, that art will help your writing. And I've been thinking about doing it. And and this year has been this winter has been very um, challenging for me because of some injuries that my daughter sustained. But 
So maybe, maybe I will. How far is Walk Hill? 45 minutes from here. Oh. I don't <laughs> <laughs> I've already thought of a reason why I can't go. But I, uh, I, a lot of times I'll have people come up to the table and they'll say, oh, I wish I could do this. I always encourage them. I said, try, just pick up. I mean, you're not going to do it like I do. I don't do like somebody else does. But, but I had one woman one time come up to the table and she was looking at everything. She said, oh, I love everything you do and wish I could do it. And I was saying, well, you could do it. And she was giving me every excuse in the world. Oh, I can't do it because of this. And I can't do it because of this. And then she says, I can't do it because I'm left-handed. I said, I'm left-handed. <laughs> I said, I explained the same thing, you know, the right hand, the right side. And she says, I don't know, I can't even draw stick figures. Well, I went home that night, I'm sitting in the chair and I'm thinking to myself, heck, I can draw stick figures. And I started doing little stick figure paintings. I did a little stick figure with the center of the body making a peace sign with this, with the arms coming out like this. I brought them up and I started selling little stick figure drawings at the flea market and they loved them. Oh my gosh! <laughs> so so I, I pick up I pick up inspiration from conversations or whatever. From but the people around you. But she's saying I I can't make stick figures. I think I can make stick figures. I probably can make money off of them. Yeah. And people will come through and they say I love these little minimalistic stick figure paintings. I like them better than the more intricate stuff. You know. That's interesting. So art is no matter what you look at is art. It's how you view it. That's true. That's true. You know? And we should all, we should all try, I guess. I'm talking to myself now. We should all try. I'll get you painting. <laughs> <laughs> you have, you have a plan, I can tell. What is over there? I am so captivated, first of all, by the bird, and second of all, by that little house that's in the picture. The year after my dad passed away, I think it was the summer after, <clears throat> my cousin Jerry, who lives upstate, she has a house up in the Adirondacks. She always invites all of us up to uh, spend some time during the summer, all of the cousins and her friends. And she said, why don't you come up and spend a week or so, you know, at the lake. And I went up. And we were sitting around one day. She said, what do you, what do you want to do today? I said, I don't know. She said, why don't we take a ride over to Vermont, to the Shelburne Museum. It's a museum up in Vermont. So I said, all right, because she knew I was doing the art and stuff. She said, I think you were really like so we went over, drove over to Vermont, to the Shelburne Museum. And in the museum, um, some of you viewers may have heard of the artist. He's a pretty famous artist, uh, Andrew Wyeth. Yes. In the Shelburne Museum is a painting called Soaring that he did. It took him eight years. He used tempera egg paints. I think it was on Masonite. You go in and the painting is huge. It's four feet by seven feet. Oh my gosh. Well, it takes up one whole, it has it all, its own room. And they have church pews where you can sit and just look at the scene. I don't want to call it a rip off that I want. I like to call it more of a tribute to Andrew Wyatt because his painting is almost like this, except he has another bird. And I just wanted to do my own version of the painting because I was so captivated seeing this massive painting in the Shepherd Museum. So I just call that tribute to Wyatt and. Uh, that was like the summer after my dad passed. I did that. I came home. Said, that painting just stuck in my mind. And I looked up some of his other artwork. I said, it's amazing the way he would do his art. And, you know, just looking at, trying to figure out how he did it. So, I mean, this doesn't compare to his painting in any way. But it's, I just like it. I think it came out well for... You know, that's very interesting. Work. Because writers get inspiration from reading other writers. And so artists get inspiration uh, from seeing, from going to museums and seeing things that other artists have done. Yeah. One million years ago, I was in Mexico City and I, I uh, was dating an artist who was preparing for a show. And his thing, his canvases were huge. And it was the kind of thing it just didn't, to me, it didn't look like anything that could go into a home. It was not any, you know, it, w it would go into a bank or maybe a municipal building or something. And, and somebody came and uh, was really taken by what he did and, and had, had done some paintings based on uh, the inspiration that he provided. So that's what happens. Yeah. 
That's what happens. We see things and then we get moved. But I am just so touched by that little house, that little building. Mm -hmm. Well, in his uh, painting, I think there was also a silo, and I think there was also another bird over in here, but uh, it kind of captured the essence of, and I didn't want to copy it, you know, stroke for stroke, because, but... Uh, and the bird, the bird is so lovely. And the way you had it flying, and then it's flying over the, over the black, you know, the black. And, you know, birds are so very interesting. I have a cat, and I watch, of course, YouTube, and I watch a lot of YouTube cat shows, and there's such detail that goes into every bird. Mm -hmm. And you have captured that whole bird. You have managed to capture the essence of that bird, I feel, anyway. Well, what I liked about his painting, too, was the whole perspective aspect that you're looking down, because. I was always interested, I actually took a course on painting perspective at Walker River, it was a one day course, maybe about four or five hour course, because it's hard to paint perspectively, and uh, just to get that perspective of being so high above the building, and perspective, I mean, the first thing they teach you in perspective is the railroad tracks, how if you look at railroad tracks, they're small, and then they elongate uh -huh. out, that's like the first thing you learn, taking perspective, but... I was always fascinated by, you know, painting in a perspective type do, of painting. Do you ever paint at Mowers Meadow when you're there for the day? I don't have time. I'm always too busy. You know, really? Waiting on customers or talking to customers. Really? Yeah. Wow. That's what my friend Louise, who passed away last year, she was 90 years old, over 90, and she was one of the first teachers I met at Walk Hill River School, and she says, do you sit and do any of your artwork at Mowers? And I said, I don't have time. That by the time I get set up and then people come in, they want to talk and, you know, or buy stuff, which is even better. And, you know, it's... Wow. But That's I think you, I, I engage my customers. I see some people actually sitting at the market doing this and they don't never even look up and make eye contact with their customers. I, I think half the battle making the sales, making the eye contact, engaging, you know, with your customers. Visiting with yeah. them. Almost everybody that walks by the booth, I'll say, good morning, how are you doing today? Or, you know, just to get a conversation going and get them into the booth. Yeah. Just to explain what I do. And, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I did that one time with a guy two years ago, and he says to me, you must have a lot of free time on your hands. I said, no, not really. I said, I'm doing this. And he said, well, I wish I didn't have to work and take BS from my boss and I could do this all day. And it's like, <laughs> and that conversation didn't go too well, but you know, it's, it is what it is. <laughs> That's true. Well, you brought some other things. Well, let me uh, show the mushrooms and then oh, we'll get okay. talking about... Uh, yeah, about that's it. a cute little... So my friend George, who actually came through his art in a similar way I did, he took care of his wife for a, long, a number of years. She was sick and he cared for her and then when she passed he just wandered into the Walk Hill River School one day and George likes to do stuff with wood. He hadn't painted but he loves to do make things with wood and uh, he came in one day not too I don't know about a month or so ago and he had done these spools and he had glued. He made the spools. He, he didn't make the spools he had the spools laying around and just constructed them with the, the uh, seashells. So he brought them in, unpainted, and he says, do you think you could do anything with these? Well, my mind's always working, so right away, yep, I can do something with those. So I painted them, I pa mounted them on the base, and <gasps> figured which way that I wanted them to, you know, be mounted and did the... So I said, uh, yeah, I brought it in, and he says, yeah, you did something with them, and uh, so we'll see how this goes the first week out to Mowers, and uh, if it does good, I'll make a few more of them, but... I thought it came out pretty cool, but he's, he was the one that came up with the idea of gluing the shells and kind of turning them into mushrooms. And, uh, but uh, George likes to do like dioramas where he'll take found objects and make dioramas. Like he'll take a half of a cat food can and make flowers coming up out of it, he'll use beer bottle caps and different uh, thir uh, uh, faucet handles and just do those really cool dioramas. And I brought a couple of them up to Mowers and I've sold them for him. Last year, two young women came to the booth, and I had one of George's paintings. 
or one of his dioramas, and they loved it. So uh, we came to an agreement on a price, and she said, oh, well, what's, what's the artist's name? And I said, George Gason, and she said, uh, oh, we really love this. She said, we, we wanted to know his name so we can tell all of our friends, and I said, well, he's going to be glad that you uh, like his art, and she said, oh, we more than like it, and they were gushing over this piece of art, and uh, I got, I so made the sale, I go home, and I called George, I said, we sold one of your dioramas, and he says, you know, the best thing, he says, not even, regardless of what you got for it, he says, the best thing to me is that they called me an artist. Wow. I said, George, you are an artist. He said, yeah, all you guys tell me I'm an artist, but he says, to have somebody in the general public that just wanders yeah. in and looks at my thing and says, yeah, what is the artist's name? And so that meant a lot to him, but uh, <coughs> yeah, George, George does some really cool stuff, and so that's kind of like our, our little well, collaboration. I think this is adorable, because look at all the little things that it Yeah, that I did all the little flowers and the butterflies, and so we'll see how that goes. That'll be a new item for Mowers when we open up. Something new. Yeah, I like to bring new things in. And if it does well, I'll make a few more of them, different color values, of course. So... Uh, that's about it. And then I brought this today. This is just a little painting that I've, I did, I don't know, five, six months ago, or maybe a year ago. I don't even know. But. Well, now, will that go to Mowers Meadow? No, that one I kind of like, so that one's going to stay in the family for a while. That will stay in the family for a while. Yeah. Sometimes I get tired of some of them and, you know, they either go up online or I sell them. But There is a woman in Troy who has a shop called Anik, and she... She does things with stones and rocks and things, and she makes jewelry. And she commented to me one time that sometimes when she makes something, she hoards it for several years, and then she turns loose of it. You know, that it. You know, I I feel like well, it speaks yeah. to her. You know, yeah. she's she's connected to it yeah. spiritually. You know. And but we were talking in your last show about some spiritual uh, events that you have participated in. Yeah, signs from loved ones and friends and you know, things that uh, you can't mistake as being signs. I mean, people may interpret it other ways, but uh, the fir very first one that I even realized that such a thing existed, I was only 12 years old, and uh, my uncle had passed away. He passed away fairly young. And uh, I remember we were sitting a couple weeks after he had passed in his kitchen, and uh, it was my grandparents, my grandmother and grandfather, and my mom and my Aunt Shirley, we called her Aunt Shir. She was there, and I don't recall if, if there was any other you know, relatives there at the time, but I do remember my mom and my Aunt Shirley there. And they were discussing how, the disposition of my uncle's car. And my mom and my aunt Shirt wanted the car to go to my cousin Billy, who was my Uncle Bill's son, because he was turning 16. And my grandfather was dead set against that. And on my mom's side of the family, they all loved each other, but it was a weird dynamic because there was never any discussion. The discussion would last like five minutes and then it would turn into an argument. <laughs> and this turned into an argument and it went on probably for a few hours. It was you know, back and forth, and everything got drug up from like 1492, <laughs> and pretty soon the argument wasn't even about the original topic, it was, <laughs> so everybody left, and uh, the next day my aunt shirt comes down to the house, and my mom was still kind of fuming about the night before arguing with my grandfather, and my uh, aunt says to my mom, she says, uh, Mary, you need to stop this. She said, I was driving home last night after leaving, and she said, I was so upset, I went past the Orange County Airport, and she said, I thought I saw Billy walk from the airport across the road. And she said, he stopped right in front of the car. She said, I thought I was going to hit him. She said, and then he went across the rest of the road and kind of just vaporized. And, you know, it's kind of weird because uh, in my mind, thinking about it years later, I think he was so upset that they were sitting there arguing about something so really superficial as a car. Right. And it just upset him so that he had to yeah. you know, make that feeling known. But my aunt swore she'd seen him. She probably did. Because, you know. 
because you know. But that was the first uh, where I'd heard of something like that happening at 12 years old, and you know. But uh, then my grandmother lived with us growing up, and she actually passed in the house that I live in. She passed at home, but she had been sick, you know, for a while. And after she passed. And I've heard Fiona talk about the energy field, they're drawn to energy and drawn to different things. Um, I had, I, I used to collect German beer steins, and after she passed, I had a musical one that you would wind up at, like a music box in the bottom. And I was in my bedroom one day, and all of a sudden the music box starts playing. And the beer stein, and I'm like, okay, that's kind of weird. And a few days later, my mom was in the room where my grandmother passed away, and my grandmother had they were like 1960 picture cubes. They were a cube, acrylic cube, and you could put pictures on each side, and they wound up. And oh, same right. Same thing. And my mom was making the bed, and all of a sudden the music cube starts playing and starts turning, and that freaked her out. I don't know. The music stein didn't really freak me out. It's like, okay, this is kind of weird, but the music cube kind of freaked her out. And I also remember on a number of occasions after my grandmother passed away, We'd be sitting watching TV and the TV would change channels. Just nobody picking up the remote or going up and changing the channel or just, we're thinking, okay, my grandmother doesn't like this program. It's, <laughs> no, no. We'll but do it's, some other one. But there's the electric field too, the, the TV and you know what Fiona had talked about, how they're drawn to electricity and drawn to the energy. And But I was thinking about that, you know, the TV's electric and so, uh, I don't know, that, that was probably some of the first ones. When my mom passed, um, I remember, well, I remember a couple of things. She was still at the house, and um, she was kind of in and out of consciousness. She had emphysema, so she wasn't getting a lot of oxygen to the brain, so she was hallucinating, seeing things and whatever. But um, we were in her room, and she looks up to the ceiling, and she says, look at that cross up there and we thought you know she's hallucinating and uh, we looked and uh, this is what she's seen and for some reason I can never get or could never get a clear picture of it, it would not allow me to focus in and get an actual clear picture of it no matter how well, I try to well it's clear enough see. you can see what you it is you can see what it is but it would never allow me to get an actual really vivid clear photograph of it that's very interesting. But after that, she ended up going into the hospital. And we stayed around the clock, my Aunt Shirley, because she was very close to her sister and me and my dad. And we were staying, she was in intensive care at that point. And we stayed around the clock. We would stay out in the waiting area and we were sleeping there. And I remember a couple of days before she passed, it was early in the morning. There was nobody walking the halls or anything in the hospital. And People tell me I was dreaming it or whatever. Eh, I might have been. I don't know. I don't know how to explain these things. Or I heard the elevator door open, and I heard two sets of footprints, the uh, footsteps, come off of the elevator. And uh, I heard one voice say to the other voice, "That's the intensive care, last stop before heaven." And I looked up from the sofa that I was laying on. There was nobody there. Now people have said, oh, you were dreaming it, you were under a lot of stress. And it's possible. I don't know. I'm not trying to, you know, rationalize or give explanations, but, you know, that's what happened. Two days later, she kept wanting to know what day. She would write down on a piece of paper, what day, what day, what day, is it what day? And my aunt told me, she says, Gary, she's waiting for your birthday because my birthday was coming up. A few days after the whole elevator thing, I went and she says, my aunt said, go in and tell her it's your birthday. So I did. And she had been comatose at that point. She had her arms up on the railing, had not moved in probably a few days. And I told her, I said, Ma, today's my birthday. And her hand came up on the railing and went like this. That afternoon she passed away on my birthday. So, she was. She was waiting for that day for whatever reason. And I thought that was a unique thing. And it bothered me for years, you know, that she passed away. 
But I found out later that my uh, my friend Brian in Montgomery, that his mom also passed away on his birthday. And my friend Linda, who I talked about in the last show that had the antique shop, her mom passed away on her birthday. So I guess it's really not that unique of a experience. Yeah. But, uh, so, but, uh, when my dad, there was a lot of them. There was a, a lot. But, uh, and I think Pop probably, because I had, uh, taken care of him so long that there was that, you know, very close connection with him. But I remember he was, uh, in hospice at that time. And we were at the facility, which I talked about last time. And I had mentioned how my cousin Nancy had come back to stay with me. And I've never heard of anybody uh, experiencing this before, but actually when we fir I first went to hospice, and the main counselor there said to me, and it was an odd question, but you know, you think of these things after. She said to me, do you think he's passing over already? Which in my mind means there's a transition from, it's not just, okay, you're here in the living world, today and all of a sudden you're, that there's a process of passing over. And there was actually a book, I should have brought the book up that they gave me during grief support, that explains the process of dying and it's not just, you know, from here to, you know, maybe next time I'll bring the book up and in case anybody wants to get the book, because it is a good book that deals with grief and, but uh, we were in his room. I was in his room the first day and uh, all of a sudden I hear birds' wings flapping. Like if you've seen birds on a lake and you would hear the mass as they would take off, uh, like a whoop 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 sound, the whole flock taking off. And I'm in his room and all of a sudden I hear all these wings. And I told my cousin Nancy about it. She said, yeah, you're out of your mind. Like she would always tell me. The next day though, she was in the room with me and we heard it again with her in there. And she's what the heck's that? I said, that's what I was telling you I heard the day before. And we never heard it again after that. But I think she got the validation that I wasn't crazy in what I heard in his room. I mean, there was no windows open or anything. It was, and I don't know how you explain that, is it? You know? But I've never heard anybody explain or have that same experience of, you know, hearing birds or angels or whatever it was that, with the winds flapping. But uh, I, I, last show I talked about Nancy seeing her mother-in-law, so I won't re go over that again. Um, I've seen, I seen an image of a spirit or whatever, however you want to describe it, at Kaplan. I've seen the upper torso of a man go into, and again, the electrical energy, go into the maintenance room, vaporize right through the energy into the, where they had like the water heaters and the, wow. all the stuff. But again, it's drawn. It seems to be drawn to that, the energy to the electricity. Yeah. And uh, after he passed, the funeral director came to hospice, and we were still there. My cousin Brenda was with me the night that he passed, and uh, we needed to go to the house to get something. The funeral director. And all the while, when he was in the hospital, I kept saying to everybody before he we went into the hospice, I kept saying, I want to bring him home, I want to bring him home. And it didn't matter if it's doctors, nurses, whatever, I want to bring him home. So we get to the house, and it dawned on me, because sitting outside the house is the funeral director with the hearse, with my dad in the hearse, and all of a sudden it dawned on me, wow, I brought him home. Just not in the way that I had envisioned bringing him home. So, yeah, my prayer was answered, just not in the way that, you know, I was hoping it would have been answered, but it was answered by... You know, I think that's so true in life. I think that we really do uh, seek answers. And sometimes they don't come in the way we want them to. You know, we have these preconceived notions and we don't know the whole picture, so sometimes the answer does not come how we wanted it to. Yeah. But, uh, 
So Brenda, she came into the house and stayed that night with me. And uh, again, the, the electrical field thing is, uh, we came in and the, uh, the ceiling light in the kitchen hadn't been working and being back and forth to Kaplan and staying there, I hadn't had time to get up and change the bulb. So we went in and I told Brenda, I said, when we go in, I gotta get a different light on because the ceiling light's not gonna work. We walked in. It worked. I flipped the switch and it hadn't been working for over two months. I flipped the switch and boom, the light came on. So again, there's that electrical energy connection to, but uh, a couple days after he passed, my friend uh, Kim, who I've known since I was 10 years old in fifth grade, she came over to the house, she knocked on the door, she said, Gary, I just had to come over, I, I couldn't call you or anything, she said, I had to come over in person. And it was around dusk, and we were sitting in the kitchen, and we were talking, and all of a sudden she says to me, Gary, I feel your father's presence, I feel his presence in this house. And I was sitting, she was sitting, facing forward, I was sitting, kind of looking at the front window, and I see this image, kind of like a, you know, a shadow image go past the window, but with like a flannel shirt on. And I said to Kim, I said, I don't know who that is, who that's coming. And she kind of spotted, seen it out of the corner of her eye also. And we heard the porch door open. And she heard it too, she's sitting right there. And I said, now who's that? I got up, she got up, because she heard the porch door open. We go open the kitchen door and look on the porch. Nobody there, but the flannel shirt. My dad always wore flannel shirts. And I seen, you know, as the image went past the window, I seen the outline of a flannel shirt on. So, I don't know. It's, he was coming back to visit. But it was at the same time, almost the same time, when Kim said, I feel your father's presence here. That's wonderful. But my cousin Essie, my cousin Nancy, unfortunately passed away last year. And um, her daughter Essie and Matt, uh, she didn't know the story about, you know, my dad with the image of going past the window. She told me that when they went back to her mom's house a few days after the funeral, they both swore they seen an image of her outside their window. And then I told her the story, because she says, I don't know what it was. She says, I thought it was Rebecca, who's her sister-in-law coming over at first. And when she said, Matt, her brother, seen it too. And she says, I swear it was my mother that I seen outside the window. I said, it probably was because I told her the story of, uh, you know, my dad. But uh, the, the strangest story, and this is, I hope we have enough time to tell this one because it's going to take a little bit of time. I call it the cemetery couple. That's the way I refer to the story. Two weeks after he passed, I had to get out of the house every day, around four o'clock for whatever reason. I just couldn't be in the house. I would just get in the car and just drive. And I ended up one day uh, in a parking lot, and it was a parking lot where me and my dad would go sometimes. There was a number of stores. And I kind of had some sort of a breakdown or whatever, because I was sitting in the car, and I, I don't know, it was almost like an out-of-body experience, because I was sitting there and I was kind of watching everybody around me going in and going out of stores but I felt like I was disconnected from everything around me. So that went on for maybe 10 minutes. I sat there just kind of getting my thoughts and my bearings and driving home, I was mad, I was angry and I talked about it, beef support and I was mad as hell at God and I was screaming at God, you know, why did you do this as I'm driving home? And I got home and uh, the next day I said to myself, that was a Saturday, the next day was a Sunday and I said, I got to get out of the house and I got to do something. So I'm, I was going to go to the flea market just to walk around and just get out around people because of, you know, just you have to. At some point, you have to do this. So I went up to the cemetery that Sunday morning just before I was going to go to the flea market. And where my mom and dad are, you can go in this little side road and you're at the top of the hill and you can see everything down below the hill. And there was nobody in the cemetery because you can see the whole lower part of the cemetery. So I got out and I'm standing by my dad's grave and you know, still grieving two weeks after and I'm standing there looking. And I look to my left and 
as close as we're sitting here together, I look and there's a young girl standing next to me with her hand out like this. Didn't say a word, just stood there like this. She had that bouquet of flowers, wild flowers in her hand. Oh my goodness. Just standing there with the, with the flowers like this. Didn't say a word. Oh my goodness. She gave them to you. So I took the flowers from her and she was, she looked young, maybe about maybe between 17 and 20. She looked like a young hippie girl from the 60s. Long pigtails, a peasant dress on. And uh, I took the flowers and I looked at her and I looked at the grave and uh, she looked at the grave and I said to her, I said, that's my dad. Uh, he passed away two weeks ago. Now she spoke not like a 17 or 20 year old kid would talk. She talked more like almost like in Victorian speech because her reply to me was, has it been two weeks already? Wow. Like she kind of knew. It's like, now what 17 year old girl would reply, has it been two weeks already? So I said, yes. And now I look up behind my car and standing there is a young guy. Long black hair, shoulder length, parted in the middle, black beard, bib overalls on. Again, like a 1960s young hippie kid. He comes down the bank. He looked almost like Jesus to me, is the only way I tell everybody the story. He comes down the little bank where my car was that leads to the grave. And he comes over to me and he comes over and gives me a hug. And she comes over and embraces me. And now normally, if you're in a cemetery by yourself and two strangers are coming up to you, you're gonna be like, oh, wait a minute, what, what the heck's going on here? And you know, but I didn't feel that at all. So they hug me and they stand there and uh, they said, um, we'll be thinking of you. And I said, thank you. And they walked up the bank, and I walked up the bank and got in the car. And as they're walking away, they're walking away hand in hand. They're both holding hands. They're walking down the little path to the exit. And he, puts, he doesn't turn around. He doesn't turn around and make eye contact with me again. But he puts his hand up like this and just waves to me like this as they're walking out. I sit there for a while, and uh, the two weeks prior, I had been... There's a little path behind my house. It goes down into the village park. And if you go down, you end up by the Walker River. And every day I would walk down there and just sit by the river and just think. And I've been doing that for the two weeks since my dad passed. I would try to do it every day just to get out, get some exercise, and, you know, try to work through my thoughts. So when I leave the cemetery, I pull out, get onto the main road. And as I'm driving, I look to the right where the path is that I'd been walking for two weeks. There's the two of them walking down the path that I had walked for two weeks. I went home and I called, picked up when I walked in the house. Now I'm kind of shaking, trying to, you know, understand what just transpired. And I pick up the phone, call my cousin Nancy, who I told you was, she didn't believe in anything. Right. I, I described anything. that whole thing. I pick up the phone and I call her up. And the first thing, <laughs> first thing she says to me is, Gary, do you have your wallet? She thought they pickpocketed me. <laughs> I said, yes, I have my wallet. And then she says, did you take acid? I said, no, I didn't take anything. I said, this happened. But she didn't believe you know, anything. And I'd asked different people afterwards. I said, have you seen this young couple? And I described them to different people I knew around town. Have you seen them around town? Nobody had seen them. So a week after this all happened, I come home one day and take notice of the positioning of these two little white flowers yes. in the photo. I hope you can get this, Ellen. The two, oh, the two right. li Those two little white flowers, if you can yes. zoom in on them. Yes. Okay, so I come home a week later, it was a week to the day, and I look down below my kitchen window as I go in the house. This is growing underneath my kitchen window. And look at the placement of how they were growing in comparison 
There they are. Even the petals are yeah. identical. Is that not wild? And I tell people, I was telling people back then, these flowers don't grow that time of year. So uh, I, I kept a journal. That was one of the grief things. Keep a journal, you know, and write down your thoughts and whatever. So I had an aunt in Jersey. She passed away a number of years ago, but I helped take care of her also. I was her health care proxy or power of attorney, co-power of attorney. And I wrote in the journal, And uh, is it okay if I read the passage yes. from the... Uh, I hadn't mentioned anything about the uh, cemetery people to her, and this was around Thanksgiving. And uh, like I say, I was telling everybody, these flowers don't grow this time of year. Everybody I talked to, I was telling this to. So I spoke to her, and I'm going to read this to you. And, uh, she was talking about her sister passing away years ago. She said her sister told the nurse in the hospital one day that she saw Jesus. The nurse retold the story to my Aunt Evelyn. She said Jesus was walking down a small dirt path, carrying a small bouquet of flowers. When telling my story of the cemetery couple, I always said they are not the kind of flowers you find around here this time of year. In fact, showing chap uh, Chaplain Tom at Kaplan, he made that sta same statement. My aunt, after saying her sister talked of a small bouquet of flowers, said, they are not the kind of flowers you find around here. And my aunt had no knowledge of the cemetery people or the whole story at that point. I went down at Christmas time and spent time with my aunt because I would visit her and uh, At that time, I finally told her about the cemetery people, and uh, she listened and said, you had an otherworldly other experience, my aunt said to me. I told her how a few weeks ago, her story of her sister seeing Jesus shocked me as it was as if I was telling her my own entire story from at least 15 years ago. Aunt Evelyn just replied, yes. She said to me that older people are many times more in tune with the other side because they are getting closer to it. Aunt Evelyn also said that she feels that our loved ones are just in another dimension. And that was how my aunt reacted to the story. Not that I was crazy or out of my mind, but she understood it. And how being, old was she? She was in her 90s at that point. She passed at 98, about eight years after my dad did, actually. You know, I have this theory that once, I don't have that much experience with men, but with women, once they get beyond 80, it's really hard to upset them, or frighten them, or surprise them, or whatever, you know, it's like, yeah, you know. But, uh, but now, these flowers were given to you. By that young girl. She that handed them to you. Standing there just like this, with right. not saying a word. Wow. And a week later, these appeared. You know. And these to appear in this part of the country in November. But the, the most unique thing was that they are identically yeah. placed. Yes. As these two flowers. And they are the in kinds. Me. And, and they are the only white ones that were in that collection. Yeah. Even the arc of the stem coming yeah. down is the same. Yeah. yeah. Is that not interesting? But uh, when my aunt did pass, I mean, I would go down and see her. She always was a giving person. She always wanted to give you something. And being in a nursing home, you know, what do you have to give when you're in a nursing home? So she would go to lunch and save her little bags of potato chips or whatever, sneak them back to her room and keep them in her closet. And you'd come down, she'd say, oh, I want to give you something. And she would always give me her little bag of potato chips, you know, and thank you, and, you know, whether it was Easter time, Christmas time, she just felt she wanted to give and share. So, she ended up on hospice too, but she only lasted a few days on hospice, and we knew that her time was coming. And, uh, there's this hot dog stand by me, not that I eat a lot of hot dogs, but every so often I want that childhood memory of getting the hot dogs. 
and I stopped at this hot dog stand and I was going over to visit my friend and I went in and uh, ordered hot dogs and the girl at the <coughs> counter gave me a bag of potato chips and she says, oh, the potato chips are on the house today. Oh, thank you. You know, it's nice. I ate the hot dogs, ate the chips. And I go over to my friend Margie's house that afternoon and uh, you know, right after leaving the <coughs> hot dog stand and we're talking and my phone rings and it was my aunt's friend Kathy down in Jersey and she told me that my aunt had passed away. I uh, asked her what time and she had passed away a half hour prior to uh, the phone call. <coughs> at the time I was at the hot dog stand being given a bag of potato chips. Wow. And I told Kathy that she said, yep, she wanted to give you one last <coughs> before she That's went off into That's very interesting. So I figured that was my sign from my Aunt Evelyn, you know, one last gift from her. But I always remember her going down. And, you know, she worked for the M&M company, even as a kid. You know, she'd always have M&Ms and all the candies and stuff. And it was, well, it was a great place to go visit growing up. And I have heard and written. Now, this was at the time that she died. This was close to the time that she died, if that happened. She had passed uh, the same day that the hot right. uh, a half hour prior, I got the bag of potato chips, mm -hmm. went over to my friend Margie's, the phone rang, and half hour, they said she passed away a half hour prior. Right. So I was actually getting the hot dogs at the time she passed. Yeah. I, I have definitely heard that, that um, when people that are close to you die, that they will send you uh, messages within the first 24, 48 hours. And, and you can hear stories that people have um, found things that, and there is a significance. Um, I, um, I knew a minister who said that he was very close to this guy and one of the things that the guy said, used to say all the time is, oh, screw. And so the guy died and for the next 48 hours, he kept finding screws. <laughs> you know, you'd open a drawer and there was a screw. You'd find, you'd go get put on a shoe and there would be a screw. And, and uh, so it was en often enough to where you couldn't just say, well, mm -hmm. you know. But uh, with the, uh, the cemetery people, actually I discussed that when I went to grief support and I discussed it with Sister Anne who was a spiritual one of the spiritual advisors at uh, Kaplan, and I told her the story, and she says, what the, the young guy and girl were, were spiritual entities presented to you in human form. She said, which is a very, very rare thing to have spiritual entities presented in human form like that. But she said she has heard of it in the past. So, that's interesting. That's interesting. She says that's rare. Hmm. I, because I do hear things, um, and yeah, that's very interesting, mm -hmm. That and it's rare. She hmm. said it's rare to have them actually present where I, I was touching them, I was, yeah. as they were hugging me, I mean, I yeah. could physically feel their bodies, and I mean, these flowers weren't handed to me. I mean, they were handed to me by this young yeah, girl. Yeah, and they I mean, were real. Yeah, there they are in well, a little you know, glass when, in my house. Uh, when, um, in the Bible, when uh, Saint Gabriel, when Archangel Gabriel appeared to Mary to tell her that he wanted her to, to give birth to the Jesus, and that's what he did. He, a he asked, he told her, you know, I mean, he needed to have her acceptance that she would take that job on. Um, he appeared as a person. And, um, you know, things like that do happen. Do you keep, um, you, you have this book here. Do you, are you recording any, um, uh, oh my gosh, we're down to two, two minutes. Oh no, <laughs> oh no, I always do that. We're out of time. So tell us again how we can get in touch with you, all of the different places where people can find your goodies. Okay, Mowers Market, 
Saturdays and Sundays. I think we open up May 20th, which would be the Saturday. Uh, Saturday. Uh, I'm the fourth booth in on the right hand side as you come into the market. Uh, eBay, GB58, just do a seller search GB58 and you can find me there. Uh, my ornaments are in the Historical Society. And uh, to give a little shout out to the Historical Society, I think they're having a concert tomorrow. Uh, I think it's going to be here in the community center, if I'm not mistaken. But go to the Historical Society or Mauer's Flea Market Facebook page and you can learn about that. Um, Walk Hill River School, May 20th, the members party. Um, you get $75, you get a free uh, piece of art. And um, you can find that on Walk Hill River Center for the Arts website. Uh, if you go and Google that, it'll bring it up. And uh, that's about it. And that's it. That's it. That's wonderful. That's a lot of different places to reach you. Mm. And this is the second time, so you can also be reached on YouTube. Yeah. Absolutely. This is wonderful. And I thank you so much for coming. And I thank Ellen. Look at this. This <laughs> is thank you so much, thank Ellen. Thank you again, Ellen. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Say good night. Good night. Good night.